thank you. I, I hate being the person responsible for making Romy stop. Oh no, 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 someone has to make it stop. Really, I really, really <laughs> it and um, I actually think that, that um, what I have to say ultimately in my paper fits so well with what you were talking about, so I think I'll have a chance to restart afterwards. But anyway, I'd like to second Romy's um, expression of thanks to all the guys in this wonderful event. And um, just before I start, I'd also like to point out that, um, that I distributed a, a handout that I'll be referring to in a few minutes. From. <clears throat> As John Rodden has reminded us in his important work on Orwell's reputation, the subject of our conference has had many labels. The truth teller, the rebel, the common man, the prophet, the virtuous man, the saint. Our discussion at the conference has pointed to several more. The socialist, the liberal, the conservative, the Tory anarchist. I'll be arguing that we need to start reading. But I, my paper today amounts to a plea from a literary scholar to add one more epithet to these. Uh, the modernist. I'll be arguing that we need to start reading Orwell alongside writers like Joseph Conrad, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, T.E. Hume, and Ezra Pound, canonical figures in the field of Anglo-American literary modernism. The phrase modernist Orwell might well strike you, as it has my colleagues in literary studies, as a contradiction in terms. Consider what we think of as the distinguishing characteristics of modernist writing. T.S. Eliot said that it must be difficult. The Wasteland and the Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock are full of ironic gestures and learned allusions. They smack of elitism. When we think about Joyce's Ulysses or Conrad's Heart of Darkness, we think of writing that is highbrow and also inward looking. Its subject, the angst of private life, or the stream of consciousness flowing beneath outward appearances. Modernist fiction, as I always tell my students, is founded on the idea that material facts are far less important than impressions. Its protagonists are pessimistic about what they know and what they can do. Modernist writing is quietistic. It aims to present rather than persuade. As Pound once put it, the goal of the serious writer is to go the way of the scientist, not that of an advertising agent for a new soap. And you will already get the reference to Comstock here. This list of attributes hardly seems applicable to Orwell. The author of the bestsellers Animal Farm in 1984 surely can't be called highbrow. The man who wrote The Road to Wigan Pier and Amish to Catalonia can hardly be said to have cared little for facts. Politics in the English language isn't exactly an argument for writing obscurely. Most of all, it would seem absurd to identify Orwell with writing that makes a virtue of epistemological difficulty and inaction. Did Orwell himself not say that every word he had written since 1936 had been in the interest of fighting against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. Surely he had to agree with Nancy Cunard and other anti-fascist activists for Spain that in a time of crisis, modernism would no longer do. My challenge here, and in the book manuscript where I've been developing my argument, is on the face of it threefold consider whether the cliches I've offered about modernism hold true, to consider whether they might, in fact, describe Orwell's work, and finally, to ask whether discovering modernist Orwell makes any real difference to how we read him. But my ultimate aim will be higher even than that. It is to argue that we are at risk of seriously misreading Orwell if we don't recognize what he is doing with modernism. Since time is short, I'll have to cut some very broad swaths across complex terrain. I want first to dispense with the objection that modernist writers, unlike Orwell, kept themselves remote from the literary marketplace. 
Recent research has shown that some modernist writers, among them Joyce and Conrad, worked very hard to ensure that their work was successfully marketed. In other words, the long-standing distinction between the realms of highbrow and middlebrow in literature has begun to collapse in literary studies. Intriguingly, Orwell himself seems to have anticipated this insight. His own fictional modernist poet, Gordon Comstock, believes he can live his writing life apart from the money god, in that great sluttish underworld where failure and success have no meaning. But in a plot that is a blueprint for 1984, he ends up trapped by capitalist economics and bourgeois morality. He is jailed for inappropriate behavior and forced to provide for his pregnant girlfriend by taking up a job in the advertising business. He gives up on his Eliotic and Joycean poem, London Pleasures, to write Bovex Ballads. As Comstock sees it, there is beastly irony in the fact that he, who wanted to be a writer, should end up in advertising. But Orwell is clearly not so bothered by that turn of events. Indeed, he troubles the distinction between highbrow and middlebrow writing throughout his career, even defining a category, elastic brow, meant to encompass both. And Alex Lord Lane has made a wonderful argument that 1984 is a perfect elastic brow novel, a complex highbrow, a hybrid, rather, of popular genres and some of modernism's more intellectually demanding techniques. But what about the next objection I've raised? Is there any way we can say that Orwell, as we might of Joyce or Conrad, or Ford Bayox Ford, or Marcel Proust, for that matter, that he's focused on the inner world of thought and feeling, or that he records impressions at the expense of facts? Leftist critics at the height of the Depression targeted this aspect of Lawrence's writing. Its focus on bourgeois subjectivity seemed intolerably self-indulgent, at a time of widespread poverty and destitution and with fascism on the rise. At least one critic accused Orwell of exactly this misplaced emphasis. Writing in 1936 about the road to Wigan Pier, Storm Jameson objected to its emphasis on Orwell's emotional responses to poverty. The first thing a socialist writer has to realize, she exclaimed, is that there's no value in the emotions started in him by the sight, smell, and touch of poverty. The emotions are no doubt unavoidable, but there is no need to record them. Let him go and pour them down the drain. 